Hi, everybody. Hope you had a good day. It's a Tuesday evening coming to you at a little bit before seven o'clock. And uh, remember the forecast, kind of a mixed bag of clouds and sun yesterday, Monday, kind of a mixed bag of clouds and sun today, Tuesday, always saying there was at least a chance for a shower. Uh, and especially uh, the KGW Futurecast model was showing that we had at least a chance, the best chance for an endless shower actually late this afternoon, early this evening. And kudos to that model because that model has come true. Now, most of us are staying dry and that's the way it always looked. But I do want to show you radar. So what you're looking at is uh, there's Salmon Creek. So this is up in Clark County just north of Salmon Creek and then up into uh, Cowlitz County as well, working up into the uh, the Cascades for the most part or some of the, the mountainous uh, foothill communities uh, and getting into Skamania County. So um, yeah, there is some rain out there and, and there are a few specks of rain even showing up down in Clackamas County in Oregon. None of this amounts to very much. Uh, I just wanted to let you know that it's there. It looks like the high temperature in Portland today, by the way, is going to come in at 80 degrees. It was 79 yesterday. Both days a little bit warmer than what I thought it would be. Uh, ended up having some some pretty good sun at times, of course, both days. Here's the live camera network. I, uh, I'm i really proud of this network that I put together. Um, it's tough to keep all 18 cameras, uh, 19 cameras going at once. The Mount Hood, Oregon Resort camera out in Walters is currently down, but that's Tillamacad. Um, from Gearhart by the Sea Resort up on the north coast. You get down into Lincoln County, Depot Bay, showing partly cloudy skies. Big sun uh, globe or orb, I should say, from Willamette Valley Vineyards and also over in Sun River. This is a really pretty shot here of Lewis River Golf Course up in Woodland. Um, it doesn't, it's hard to tell, but it doesn't look like anybody's really shouting rain. Clouds are a little bit thicker. You can see up in Kelso, that's Three Rivers Golf Course. And again, we've got some rain up in parts of uh, Cowlitz County. So keeping an eye on all of that. The shower chance will be ending overnight tonight. And then we go clear. And I'm going to show you the seven day in, in a moment. I do want to, um, let me, let me switch things around a little bit as I often do. And let me take this full screen. I do want to give you a, a real quick update on what Hurricane Lee is doing. So uh, here's the latest from the, the Hurricane Center. The, the storm has barely budged at all yesterday. Now it's nudged itself a little bit to the west and to the north during the day today. So here's Lee, National Hurricane Center reporting Sustained winds at 115 miles per hour. That is still a Category 3 hurricane, so considered a major hurricane. The track from this point forward pretty much is going to start moving this hurricane tonight and tomorrow due north. With landfall up here, northeast of Maine, pardon me, up into the Halifax area and Nova Scotia, as potentially either a fairly weak Category 1 hurricane or a tropical storm that makes landfall this upcoming Saturday night into Sunday. So that's the latest. It looks like right now confidence is somewhat good that the center of the storm on this projected track will stay out to sea just far enough that it will mostly leave the United States mainland alone with the exception of some dangerous uh, high surf and high tides. Here's the latest infrared satellite picture from the hurricane. I don't know why I'm going hoarse all of a sudden. Again, here's Puerto Rico. Here are the Bahamas. Of course, there's Florida and there are the Carolinas. And here is Lee. That The uh, eye right there that you can see was measured earlier today, pardon my voice, at some 80 miles in diameter. That's a big, big wall. It seems like the eye walls has been kind of fluctuating and redeveloping from time to time. But I think at this point, I don't want to jinx it, but it really looks like the Hurricane Center has done a good job on being really consistent with this hurricane uh, tracking path. So let's assume that it goes due north and it stays off of the U.S. mainland. Okay, let me let me move this back. I hope this doesn't bug you. It kind of bugs me when I can't uh, see what I'm looking at, moving my face around. Okay, so the rain chance ends tonight. Tomorrow, Wednesday, we're going to see some valley fog or some morning clouds, and then we clear out. And then once we clear out, we're basically going to stay mainly clear all the way through the rest of the week, and we're going to start to warm up. I think we're up into the 80s tomorrow. Wednesday, I've got 82. Could be as warm as 84. And then Thursday's the first day right here on the left side of the screen that we could hit 90. Uh, it's a 580, pardon me, a 585 high that's building in across Oregon. Um, 
the record high Thursday is 92. I've got 89 on my seven day. I'm probably going to bump that up to 90 degrees. And then Friday should be at least as warm, if not a little bit warmer. I still think we could go as warm as 94 on Friday. Again, it's not an incredibly strong upper level high until you figure the fact that it's, well, getting into mid-September. So that's a pretty good high. We could still be in the 90s on Saturday, and then we'll start to cool off uh, away from this. But that's the way the ridge is setting up on the upper level maps uh, over the next couple of days. And with that said, here's my seven day. Now, stick with me because I'm going to be getting into some El Nino notes. And I think you'll find this very interesting. But for now, clouds to sun, 82 tomorrow. Sunny Thursday, 89. Maybe I lift that to 90. 92, 94 on Friday. 90, 92 on Saturday. 80s on Sunday, Monday, then cooling down into the uh, 70s on Tuesday. I don't see any wind. For the most part, this is a pretty quiet forecast. It's going to be heating up for the next uh, couple of days. Okay. What I hope you will find interesting, because our weather is really pretty quiet. Let, let's talk El Nino. So I, I'm all in right now on doing my research uh, for my winter outlook, which I hope to have out somewhere between mid-October and late October in terms of publishing it here online, on YouTube, and on uh, the KGW. So we talked about this the other day. El Nino typically produces a wet, active subtropical jet across the southern part of the United States. That can be really wet weather for Southern California, for example, and even up into Northern California. We have a tendency, the stereotypical flow, to be somewhat dry. Again, we talked about this the other day. I also showed you these flow patterns the other day. The point of this being November is showing ridging on the American GFS model, December the same, and January the same. So if that's true, that could be a signal for one of two things. Mild temperatures, unless we get a surface high that produces inversions, which that means you get chilly at night and then the fog forms and you never warm up. And you don't get the warm weather that you think you're going to get. But these ridges can go one of those two ways. And then also you would think these ridges have a good chance to produce some below normal precipitation. That's just a very simple meteorology eyeball test. Doesn't mean that's you know set in stone, but but if you look at these three ridge patterns, El Nino coming in mild with maybe a below normal winter pattern is the first thing that pops into your mind. Now let's get into some research. So according to uh, oh boy, here I go moving my face around again. According to um, NOAA and the National Weather Service, their projections, this is a wide range, have the, the El Nino being at least a full degree Celsius above normal uh, in the equatorial surface waters of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of South America to as warm as two degrees above Celsius. Now you're like, well, that's one degree, right? What's the big difference? Here's the difference. Plus one would be considered a moderate El Nino. Plus two, if you got to, to plus two or better, that's not only strong, but that gets into what we classify as super strong or super El Nino. So that slight difference is huge. And I think it's still a little bit early to really determine which is which. There's also the dynamic models, which are basically the models that use a lot of modern technology, a lot of variables going in, a lot of computer models going in to what's called the dynamic modeling. That modeling likes to go really warm, two degrees or better, like a super El Nino. If you look at the good old fashioned, what's considered the statistical uh, the statistical output for this year's El Nino, that's closer to this moderate El Nino of plus one. That's kind of the old fashioned way that we used to do things before we had the super modeling uh, and then supercomputers and all that. I'll get more into that in the coming weeks. But anyway, if you look at this plus one to plus two Celsius, the comparison winners, if you just go back to 2000, you come up with the comparative years of the winter of 2002, 2003, 2009, 2010, 2015, 2016. Three winters fit this comparison set going back to 2000. Now, I think it makes sense to start only looking from 2004 because our, our climate is warming. I'm not going to get into the reasons it's warming, but the fact of the matter is, um, if you just look at the reporting sites, many of which have not changed in the last 40 plus years, we are seeing significant warming in our local area. I'm just talking about in our local region, Oregon and Washington, since 2000. So when I can, I really lean heavily on just 
the past winters since then. Now, obviously, three winters is not a very big data set. I'll go ahead and I'll go back later and look all the way back to 1980. But here's what's interesting. If you look at these three years, and if you look at the months, November through March, I consider the main rainy winter season November through March for my winter outlook. That's 15 months. 13 of those 15 months were above normal temperature wise. So that's really compelling that we would be in a very mild winter. A lot of information on this graphic and let me just read you through it. So comparison winters, the years that we just, those three seasons we just looked at. If you run the data on those years for PDX, you come up with little to no valley snow. This would not be surprising. It's what you would expect with a decent El Nino stream. Anywhere from no snow at all, I mean, not seeing a single flake on the valley floor in Portland to as much as the winter could bring two inches. Now, there could be some spots above the valley floor in the West Hills and Sandy and that type of thing. But generally speaking, in the I-5 flats of the valley from Salem up into Portland, you wouldn't expect really any snow this winter. Mount Hood snowpack. This is not great, but it's not awful. The average of the three years I showed you come in at 74% for the Mount Hood specific snowpack measured uh, at about 5,400 feet. It's not awful. It's not great. 74%. Most of those winters, when I went back and looked at the data, if anything, they were just slow to get going. There wasn't a lot of snow over Christmas break. There really wasn't a lot of snow until we got into the back half of February and went into March and the spring break season into April. But again, I have a lot more data to look at, a lot more things to calculate. This is kind of a preliminary uh, output just based on those three seasons I showed you. Valley rain. This surprised me. Total wild card. Anywhere from one of the years, one of the years I looked at was actually four inches below normal. All right. I would kind of expect that. But another year had a whopping 12 inches above normal. I think most of that was a crazy wet December. So for now... Maybe we're not going to be dry, you know? I mean, that the ridging that the modeling is showing right now is pretty convincing to me, but I've got to look more at the precip. There's still hope is a point of this that maybe we have some decent precipitation. Mild winter, December through February. So when you look at those three years, all three of them had two out of three months from December through February, two out of three of those months were really warm. We're talking like three, four degrees mean temperature above normal. That's very, very mild stuff. Uh, again, they look like November kind of could go either way, but by the time we got in December, um, things really started to warm up. Now, again, two out of three months in that period were warm. One of the years had a really cold December because there was about a 10-day stretch of an Arctic outbreak that had low temperatures in the teens, for example. But overall, a lot of signatures that maybe not every single day or every week or every month, but a good chunk of the winter is going to be mild. And then this was interesting, a high chance for several wind events. I found several events in every year with what caught my eyes, an unusually high number of gusty days of 40, 50 mile per hour winds in the valley, a couple of 100 mile per hour wind days at the coast, a couple of extreme wind days out in the gorge, that type of thing. Not a Columbus Day storm, but just a number of days where it was windy enough for some sort of a wind advisory. So there's all that going on. Um so anyway, that, that's what I have for you today. Um, I, I find my, my winter outlook stuff to be very interesting. It's why I do it every year. That's why I spend countless hours over a period of about six weeks doing my research. So to me, it's kind of fun just to step-by-step, step, just throw some data out there and get you thinking about it, but realize I have a lot more data sets to find and come up with and correlation work to do. Uh, this was just one finger, and I've got a lot more fingers to put together, if you will, okay? For now, I will thank you for subscribing to my YouTube channel. I'll talk to you soon.